can a person with dementia be seen in different ways by different people? Or can a person with dementia be seen in different ways by the same person? And the next question is, can a different view of a person with dementia actually change the way we care for them? And the third question, can that new view actually change their individual capabilities and cognitive and functional status? And I'm going to claim that the answer to all those is yes, and I'll give you some stories about that as we go. So I want to talk about two models of care. The traditional one, which I'm calling the biomedical view of dementia. And you've got some charts on page one of your handout, those last three slides, that sort of illustrate what I'm going to talk about. So if you're the kind that likes to follow along visually, you can do that. And then we've got this new one, which I'm going to call an experiential view. And I'm going to start by giving you a whole new definition for dementia. And it's not going to talk about plaques or tangles or brain changes or tau protein or any of that stuff. I'm just going to have a very simple kind of fuzzy definition. And I'm going to say dementia is a shift in the way a person experiences the world around her or him. That's all, just a shift in the way we experience the world around us. And I like this definition for a couple of reasons. First of all, what we tend to do with dementia is we stigmatize it. We put people in a box and there's something foreign that we don't understand. And the truth is that what I just described applies to everybody in this room because we've all had a shift in our experience and our perspective. And uh, without taking a poll of ages here, I can guess that if you're 50 or 60 years old or older, you probably don't experience the world the way you did when you were 20 or 25. Is that true? I won't, you know, won't look for the head nods to see who just fit the age range I said. <laughs> and if you're 20 or 25, I would wager that you probably don't experience the world the way you did when you were 10 or 12. I'll bet that's true as well. So as we live, as we experience life, we have a changing perspective. We have a changing view of the world. It doesn't mean we've gone anywhere. It means that we've changed in the way we think and process what's going on around us. Now, we know that a person who's been diagnosed with dementia or some form of forgetfulness has this maybe more rapidly or more drastically than the rest of us, but at least we can start to begin to understand what the person might be going through. And that's very important because if we are to begin to understand what those unmet needs are, we have to be able to start to try to get inside the skin of people who live with dementia and understand what they're experiencing. So we can't distance ourselves. We actually have to get closer to people to figure this out. So if we look at that and start with that definition, let's just go back for a moment to the left side of your chart, which is the biomedical view. And that is that dementia is a progressive, irreversible, ultimately fatal disease. It's characterized by a loss of neurons, brain cells, loss of cognitive domains, and we see it mainly as a tragic, costly, and ultimately burdensome disease. Now, I can't stand here and tell you that none of that is true. What I want to tell you, though, is that this is our focus. It's a declinist or a deficit-based, disease-based focus. And what that does is it puts blinders on us, and it makes us behave in certain ways and treat in certain ways that are very limited. So I want to step back and I want to go to the other side, which is this experiential idea that dementia is a shift in experience. When you start looking at that and you don't start looking at decline and death and irreversible and disease, all of a sudden you realize things that you already knew but for some reason you hadn't thought of because you were blinded. You realize that the brain is, brain is actually plastic, that new learning can occur. Even in, quote, advanced stages of forgetfulness, people can learn new things. Now, I think we kind of know that. We just don't acknowledge it because it's not the way we look at people. Um, and if, if I haven't convinced you that a person with uh, very severe stages of forgetfulness can learn new information, let me suggest an experiment in whatever your living environment is. And that is get three or four care partners and take a gentleman down to a shower room and give them a shower that they don't want to have and force them to have that shower. And then three or four days later, take them to the same room and see if they remember anything about what happened the other day. I think you'll find that there's some very powerful imprinting going on. There are studies that show that there's both explicit and implicit learning and memory that goes on throughout all stages of dementia. So it's very important to remember that the brain is learning, that people have the capacity for well-being and growth. They're not just declining. Uh, sometimes it's helpful to think of dementia as a disability instead of a fatal disease. Richard Taylor, a good friend of mine who was diagnosed with Alzheimer's almost 10 years ago, a psychologist and lecturer who now travels the world telling what it's like to live with dementia. He says, I'm not dying of a fatal illness. I'm living with a chronic disability. And I think that's a nice way to shift our thinking about what people are going through. And another way I like to explain this is to imagine a gentleman in a wheelchair. This is not a person with dementia. This is maybe a player for the 49ers who had a spine injury and is now paralyzed from the waist down, paraplegic. 
And, you know, he's got a different experience of the world than he did a few days before. And if he were to go downtown and come to a building that had 25 steps to get in the door, he would have a lot of trouble accessing that building because he can't get his chair up the steps. Now we have the Americans for Disabilities Act, and it says, you know what, we want people who can't walk to be able to be successful in a world of people who walk. So we're going to build disability access. We're going to build ramps for wheelchairs. We're going to build elevators and power-assisted doors and other types of disability access. So now we've helped this gentleman to succeed. The problem is we don't build ramps for people with dementia. And I'm not talking about physical ramps. I'm talking about cognitive ramps. And when we talk about the stress, I'm going to come back and take you a little farther down there. Getting back to research, and I know I talked, I had a long talk with Patrick the other night about this. And, and you know, if you see dementia as a, an irreversible, fatal, tragic, costly, burdensome disease, you're going to put every dime you got into trying to find a pill to cure this. And that's basically what we do with our, with our charitable organizations. All that money goes into drug research. Now, I'm not here to discourage all drug research. I really think that that's important. I personally believe that the, the drugs we're using to try to give symptomatic treatment of dementia, drugs like Aricept and Nemenda, they do some things for some people, but they're not the answer. They're not reversing or even slowing or stopping the course of memory loss. So we need better medications, and I do believe we will get better medications that will help impact that. I'm not holding my breath for a cure, though, and it's because of what I said at the beginning, that changes in the brain are so intricately tied to aging of the brain and aging of the body just like heart disease, just like kidney disease, just like wrinkling of the skin and graying or loss of the hair. And for me, for someone to say, we're going to cure dementia, we're going to cure Alzheimer's, to me that's like saying we're going to cure aging. Uh, you know, will there ever be a day, if we want to live past 30, will there ever be a day when a person never has a heart attack, never has kidney failure, never has forgetfulness that we consider out of, out of ordinary? I don't think so. And I'm not saying that to be pessimistic. I'm actually saying it for the opposite reason. I'm saying that what we do now in medicine is we give you your Aricept, we give you your, your uh, Nemenda, and we say, we've done all we can. We don't have a better pill. And we put millions of people's lives on hold because we're waiting for that pill to come along. And we spent millions of dollars and haven't found that magic pill. And the truth is that with a change in the way we care for people, we actually can do much more for a person's life than any available pill on the market today or probably for a long time to come. And so that's why we need to put some of that, a good chunk, of that money that goes into drug research into care research. Better models of care, better approaches to care. We're putting all the money in one basket and that doesn't help anybody today who's neither gonna be prevented nor cured of their forgetfulness. If you look at what this biomedical line of thinking does to us, it takes us in this idea that people with dementia are incapable and need to be protected. And that usually means disempowering them, taking choices away, institutionalizing, over-medicating, isolating people. And what often happens is that uh, if somebody has a little trouble making one decision, we take them all away. 